Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to one of our seminar halls. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Carol Desnos, who is a professor at uh, in South Rennes in France. We actually did our uh, PhD almost together. And uh, he's going to give us a talk about uh, a framework for machine learning. So please, Carol. Thank you for inviting me for, for this seminar, and uh, I'm very happy to, to present this work to other people. Uh, so, uh, I'm Carol Desnos. Uh, I'm uh, part of a, okay, let me see if it works. Yes, uh, I'm part of a INSAREN, which is an engineering school, IETR, which is my research laboratory, and the Vader research team, which is uh, the cool name that we have for for our research team. Uh, the work I'm going to present today is not a, a solo work. It's a collaborative work uh, with a, a few people, uh, a few uh, PhD students and intern students, and also some uh, other permanent researchers from uh, my team. So this work is entitled Single Program Graphs, uh, Reinforcement Learning for Hardware-Friendly and Gradient-Free Machine Learning Technique. So first of all, a uh, brief introduction of uh, who am, uh, am I. Uh, I am an associate professor at INSAREN, which is a French uh, engineering school. So here the diploma is uh, obtained after five years of uh, study. And I am part of, uh, I'm a teacher in the electronic and computer engineering department. Uh, uh, my research work is done at the IETR laboratory, which stands for Institut d'Electronique et des Technologies du Numérique. Uh, and this laboratory is a part of the CNRS uh, French National uh, Research Organization. The research team I'm part of is called the Vader team for video analysis and architecture design for embedded resources. Uh, the objective of this uh, research team is to bring together a researcher that works on uh, computer vision and um, image compression algorithm and to bring them together with a researcher working on um, embedded uh, architectures and uh, software programming for such embedded resources and so i'm mostly on the i mostly work on the embedded resources resources part of the the team uh, also something important about me i like negative results uh, okay, so I don't like to obtain negative results, but I think that uh, negative results are important. And so I'm trying to push a few uh, initiatives uh, to, to make it possible to publish this kind of results. So the basic idea is that when you do some valuable research process, you may set up a nice experiment with a nice idea behind your mind, and then the results are not what you expect them to be because maybe you didn't realize, didn't realize that something would, would go wrong. And so I try to, to give some opportunities to researchers to publish this kind of uh, negative uh, scientific uh, results. Uh, at the moment, there are two possibilities to publish this kind of results in our domain. Uh, the first one is uh, as a special session in the SAMOS conference. And the second possibility, uh, which uh, started this year, is uh, a special track uh, in a journal, in the Springer Journal for Signal Processing System. And the idea is that these results are valuable, and by publishing them, you can value your, your work, but you can also help some other researcher avoid doing the same thing as you did, and maybe providing them some insight of why it, why it failed. So I think it is valuable and it should be published. So don't, don't hesitate to contact me if you, you are interested in this, uh, these opportunities. Uh, what are my research interests? Uh, first of all, uh, my PhD, uh, my PhD, uh, during my PhD, I was working on uh, model based uh, computer aided design. So the basic idea is to use uh, data flow models of computation to uh, represent uh, applications. Uh, and to specify the inner parallelism in a intuitive and quite developer friendly way. And from these data flow models of computation, you can very easily uh, deploy and optimize the deployment of application on complex architectures. And in our case, on complex uh, multi-core heterogeneous architectures. And so this is my main research topic and the one that I pursued during my PhD also. And now I also work on image and video coding for machine learning. So here the basic idea is that uh, when you encode an image and when you compress it to send it on a network, basically what you are doing is that you are losing some quality. And there are some 
standards that tell you how to compress videos and what uh, level of uh, what quality you can lose without damaging too much the subjective quality of people that will look at the video you are giving them. But today, many videos that we are generating are not intended to be seen by human uh, viewers. They are intended to be seen only by artificial intelligence. And these artificial intelligence are much more resilient uh, than us to the noise, uh, to the compression noise that you can add in the, in the videos. So here, the idea is to to try to, to take advantage of this opportunity and to try to design some new uh, image and video compression schemes to lower the quality of images that you transmit uh, in a much more uh, violent way than what you would do for a human receiver, because you know that the AI won't care about the subjective quality of the video. And finally, that what I'm going to talk about today is about machine learning. So I have a quite recent interest, let's say, on uh, frugal AI, so on very on energy efficient artificial intelligence. And what I'm going to talk about today is about tangled program graphs. So of course, at any time, you can uh, interrupt me uh, during the presentation if you have any questions. So tangled program graph and tangled artificial intelligence. Is this what it looks like? Unfortunately, it is not. It is only in my dream. It's a mix between artificial intelligence and uh, tangled. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, this talk won't be about this. It would be about another kind of tangled uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, when you talk about artificial intelligence, usually people immediately think about deep learning. And the current trend in uh, deep learning is to try to go as fast and as fat as possible. So on the hardware side, the cores that are uh, developed to support uh, deep, learning, uh, for deep learning algorithms are becoming fatter and fatter. And by fatter, I mean that they try to support uh, more uh, Terra floating operations per second. So for example, here I have three uh, three uh, figures on uh, chips that were uh, developed by three different uh, companies. The first one is from Graphcore, a British company th uh, that developed uh, a, a chip uh, for training and inferring uh, artificial uh, deep learning uh, network. And they are the latest generation of their chip, which is not embedded at all, it's a huge chip, uh, supports 20, uh, 125 teraflops, uh, terafloating operation per second in uh, uh, half precision. Uh, the Tesla chip uh, supports almost uh, more than twice the, the number of teraflops as the graph core. And when you have a look at a more embedded friendly uh, company, the GreenWave uh, Green technology uh, chips, which is a French company uh, based on uh, RISC-V cores, uh, when you have a look at the number of floating operations per second that they support on the, the their two latest generation of chips, you can see that basically one of their main goal between gap eight and gap nine, which are the two last generation of their chip, is to increase the computing power, the computational power of their chip by a factor uh, seven, almost between the two generations. So basically, when it comes to chips, uh, supporting deep learning model, you can see that the trend is to try to build chips that are, have as much computational power as possible. On the modeling side, on the deep learning network side, uh, the trend is, let's say, the same. On this graph, which is not for me, you have the reference at the bottom of the slide, uh, you can see the number of parameters of a few uh, state-of-the-art neural networks, and you can see the accuracy of this network uh, on the ImageNet uh, data set. And one last thing that is important, the size of the circle in the images represents the number of multiple accumulation operations that you must do to uh, perform an inference of the model. And basically what we, what we can see in this figure is that the fatter the model is, the best its results are on the ImageNet uh, accuracy uh, data set. On the accuracy on the image the data set, sorry. And yeah, you can see some models that are a bit smaller and that have a good accuracy, but yeah, there is no secret. If you want to have a better accuracy, you need to create a, a larger model. And to support this larger model, you need to have a more efficient uh, computer architecture. So this is a trend in uh, deep learning, uh, in deep learning. And what I want to talk about today is something completely different. Basically, 
what I'm interested in, interested in is another machine learning technique that is not based on deep learning and that, as we can see, has some key advantages when it comes to the complexity of the models to, to perform its task. So let's go. Let's talk about this, uh, this model. Uh, the model I am presenting today is a reinforcement learning model. So reinforcement learning is a branch of machine learning. It's a sub part of machine learning in which you have an artificial intelligence that is trying to learn to do something useful in an environment. So this is the playground of the, of the artificial intelligence. And this artificial intelligence must figure out on its own how to do something useful and valuable in this uh, playground. So a bit of terminology, the artificial intelligence in this context will be called the learning agent and the playground will be called the learning environment. To learn how to do something useful in this environment, uh, you need to have some interactions between the agent and the environment. The first interactions that you have is that the learning agent can observe the state of the learning environment. So it can observe the state, and as a result of this observation, it can react and it can do an action, it can perform an action on the environment. As a result of this action, or as a result of time or randomness or physical uh, phenomenon, the state of the learning environment will evolve. And the learning agent will have the ability to observe this new state of the environment and to react by doing a new action. To learn how to do something useful in this uh, learning environment, the learning agent needs a third uh, way to interact with the environment. And to learn if the set of actions it is performing is useful or not, it, le it needs a last interaction with the learning environment, which is a reward. So basically, the reward will tell the learning agent whether the sequence of action it is doing is useful or it has some benefits, or if it is useless or even harmful. And based on this reward, the learning agent will learn if the, the set of actions it is doing is useful or not. And it will try to adapt the sequence of actions it is doing uh, to try to maximize the reward given by the learning environment. Okay, let's continue with a simple example of a reinforcement learning uh, application. One very common uh, reinforcement learning application is to train a learning agent to play a video game. So in the case of a video game, the learning agent will observe the state of the environment and this state will simply be the pixels of the screen of the learning environment. So you are not telling the learning agent where the aliens are or where the, the ship is or where, where you can shoot the missiles. No, you are just giving it the pixels, the raw, the raw pixels of the environment, and you let the learning agent figure out what it means and what it represents. The actions performed by the learning environment on the learning agent simply are the buttons of the video game controller. So the learning agent can press any combination of, uh, of buttons of the video game controller when it wants to interact with the learning environment. And in this case, the reward is simply the score that you obtain when you finish a game uh, within the learning environment. And to train itself uh, in this kind of learning environment, the learning agent simply has to play the game many, many times. And every time it will try to increase the, the score it gets until hopefully it uh, reaches the highest score possible for this video game. So th this was just a simple example of a reinforcement learning um, uh, application. So now the question becomes, how can we build this learning agent? What are the techniques, uh, the machine learning techniques that we can use to build this learning agent? There are many of them. And of course, the first one is deep learning. Uh, today, one of the, the most common way to build a, a reinforcement learning agent is to use a deep learning model uh, as the brain of this, uh, of this process. Uh, historically, uh, one of the maybe the, the most well-known uh, uh, reinforcement learning technique is Q-learning. Uh, it's a technique which requires you to model exhaustively all the states uh, that the learning environment can, can reach. So if you have a small uh, state space in your learning environment, this is feasible, but if you have a very large uh, state space for your learning environment, then uh, this technique becomes a bit complex. And this is why 
now today, uh, what we do is that we use the deep learning models to approximate the results of a uh, queue learning uh, technique. There exist many, many other uh, machine learning techniques that you can use uh, as the brain of the, the reinforcement learning agent, but I won't talk about them today. The one I'm interested in today are tangled program graphs. So, uh, tangled program graphs, or TPG for short, uh, is a reinforcement learning technique that was proposed originally by Stephen Kelly and Malcolm Haywood, which are two researchers from uh, Canada, from the University of uh, Dalhousie in, uh, I think the city is Halifax or something like that, uh, in Canada. Uh, and this uh, machine learning model, this reinforcement mo learning model, uh, is modeled with a graph. Uh, in this graph, you have three types of elements. The first one are the teams of the graph. The teams are the internal uh, vertices of the graph. So the, the, the teams, the, the vertices of the graph that have, have outcoming edges. Then you have the actions. The actions are the leaves of the graph. So a leaf of a graph is a node of the graph that does not have any outgoing edge. And finally, uh, you have the programs. The programs are the edges of the graph, of the tangled program graph. In order to understand how a TPG uh, works, uh, we first need to understand what a program of the TPG is. So let's have a look inside. Uh, if you consider a program of a TPG as a black box, then the program will simply receive a copy of the state of the environment. It will process it, and as a result, it will produce a number a number which is called a bid for reasons that we, I will explain later on. Uh, what's very important to know at this time is that the number produced by the, pro by the program does not have any meaning. It is not a probability. It does not measure anything. It is just a number that will have some meaning when compared to other numbers. But this is not like in deep neural network. This cannot be seen as a probability of anything. This is just a number produced by the program. What is inside the program? Uh, the program uh, resembles uh, an assembly program. So you have a sequence of simple instructions uh, that uh, produce results in a set of registers. The, so in this case, the instructions uh, can be an addition, a, multipl a multiplication, or an exponential computation. Uh, the operands uh, of these instruction can be taken from the from the state of the environment that you are observing. So in this case, I'm taking the value of some pixel of the environment as the operand of the of these instruction. But these operands can also be the result of a previous instruction, the 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 result of a previous instruction that was stored in a register and that I am reusing for further computation. Finally, the result of the last instruction of my program is the result of the program itself. So this is how the programs of the tangled program graph work. You give them an image, they process it, and they produce a number as a result. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, now that we have seen how the basic uh, programs of the TPG work, let's see how the TPG graph itself works. To, the first thing that we need to know is that uh, each leaf uh, of the program, uh, each sorry, each leaf of the TPG, which is called an action, is associated to an action on the environment uh, you are playing in. So, for example, here, if we took again, if we take again the video game example, each one of the leaves of my tangle program graph is associated to a, a combination of a button of the video game controller that I want to press. So to begin the execution of a tangled program graph, the inference of a tangled program graph, I will first receive a new state of the learning environment. And I will start executing my TPG from the unique root team of my TPG. A root team is a node of the graph that does not have any incoming edge. This is the only node of the graph that does not have incoming edge. So this is the root team of my graph. So I start from this root team, and from this root team, I will execute all the programs on the outgoing edges of the root team with the current state of the environment as a parameter. 
from this execution, I will get three uh, results of my program, three different values. And this is when this value makes sense. I will compare the values uh, given by the three programs to each other, and I will just identify the largest value. And this will be, this will give me, this will tell me the path I should follow to continue the execution of my TPG. So here, the winning bid is 66.6. .6. I will follow this bid and go to the next node in my TPG. And then I do the same again. I will execute the programs on the outgoing edges of the active team, get the results, follow the winning bid, and eventually I will reach a leaf of my TPG. Uh, and this will give me the action that I should perform on the environment. I do this action. I receive a new state uh, resulting from this action. And then I start again the inference of my Tangle program graph from the root team of my uh, TPG. Uh, okay, as I told you at the beginning, if you have any questions, you can interrupt me at any time. So if I have no question, I will assume I can continue the explanation. And if something is unclear, you can ask me right now. That's so far, so good. Okay, um, 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 my name is Milo uh, Cairo. Thanks for uh, the detached presentation. It's going to be a quick question at this point. I think it's important to, to understand that. Um, how do you decide uh, from the output of the programs that you execute uh, out of the routine which one is best? Uh, because you don't have explicit operation to make the decision there, right? You said, okay, we want to pick the one on the left, but uh, this is based on what? Which criteria do you use to do that? So you mean how how can I make sure that the path I am selecting is uh, the right one? Is the, yes. Is this... What is what is the decision yep. that you make? Okay, the, this decision is made uh, during the training process. Basically, the, what I didn't explain uh, yet, I will explain it later, is okay. how you obtain this structure. What I, what I am presenting here is a pre-trained uh, Tangle program graph. So I assume that this structure is the result from my training process. So if my training process went well, then the path I am following should be the good one. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is, this is how it works, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. If there is no other question, I will continue the explanation then. Okay, great. Let's continue. So, how to train this uh, TPG? How to get this uh, Tangle program graph? Well, to do that, we need to go through genetic learning process. So actually the TPG uh, was inspired by the work of the community, of the huge community that is working on the genetic programming uh, uh, techniques. And so the basic principle of genetic uh, programming is that you start from a first uh, population of individuals. So basically you start from a set of random graphs. See, so policies that you have uh, initialized randomly. and this initial population is evaluated in the learning environment. So you basically you play the game with this initial with each member of this initial population, and you get a score for each member of this initial population. And then you do some natural selection. So you have a look at the score of the 100 individuals that you had. Uh, you get rid of the 80 individuals that got the worst score. You keep the 20 individuals that got the best score. And then you apply some genetic evolution process to regenerate the 80 uh, individuals that you, you, you have thrown away. And by doing that, you create a second generation of uh, individuals and then a third and then a fourth and so on. And along the way, along this natural selection process, the score, the average score and the best score that you will get in the populations that you have at each generation will increase uh, thanks to the natural selection process. So this is the basic principle of the training process of the TPG. How does this actually work on the Tangle program graph? So when you want to train a TPG, in reality, you won't have a single root team. You will have several of them. And at the beginning of the training process, you will uh, randomly create a first uh, Tangle program graph with, let's say, 100 uh, root teams. Uh, each one of these root teams uh, 
uh, represents a different uh, learning agent. It represents an individual of my population. And if I start playing the game from the green uh, root team, I will get a completely different result uh, than if I was playing my game from the pink uh, root team. And so each individual, when playing the game, will obtain a different score. From th these scores, I will identify the root team that have the best score, the one at the center here, and I will identify the one with the worst score, and I will simply discard them. I will throw them away. Now I need to populate again the root team of my graph. So I need to create new individuals to prepare the next generation of my genetic learning process. And to do that in the Tangled program graph, I will do it in two steps. The first one is to randomly select uh, a team, a remaining team of my TPG, and to clone it, to duplicate it. So here I have copied this root te this uh, team to create a new root team. And as you can see, the outgoing ages of this team are the same one as the one uh, I copied. And here the same, I copied the, the pink team to create a new uh, root team, which is the blue one here, which references the exact same programs as the pink team. So this is the first part. First, I copy the team. At this point, this is not very interesting. But then I will apply some mutation. I will randomly, pseudo-randomly, uh, have a look at the outgoing uh, edges of the teams that I have just created, and I will apply some random mutations to them. So here, for example, for the new yellow root team, uh, I have mutated the, the program on these edges. So now, uh, the the program on the left is a mutated copy of the program I had here. And by mutated, I mean that I copied the program and then randomly I have swapped some instruction. I may have removed or added some instruction in the in the program, or maybe I have changed uh, the operation of one of the instruction. It was a multiplication. Now it's uh, an addition, uh, or maybe I have changed the, its operand. And all of this is done completely randomly. And the same here, I uh, changed uh, the destination the destination of one of the program. Uh, here, the blue team was previously referencing uh, this program. And uh, now, thanks to the mutation, the destination of this program has changed. And now the blue team is referencing the pink uh, team of my TPG. As a result of this uh, pseudo-random uh, mutation process, uh, so I hear that there are some, there is a beep uh, in the yes, course. Yes, I, yes. I don't know if there is a text message. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a question. Uh, I okay. raised my hand. Uh, um, so in this case, one, one generation, uh, each generation is one graph. Is, is that it? Or, or you, you can have several graphs uh, on each uh, generation? No, uh, in each generation, you have one graph with uh, several root teams. Okay, and in this case, you just show uh, four root teams, but it, it could have many. Yeah, uh, if you have a population with only four root teams, the learning process won't be very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, for the natural selection process to work, uh, like in nature, you need to have a lot of individuals. So uh, usually we have between 100 and 1,000 uh, different individuals at each generation. And it's a trade-off. The more individuals you have, the longer it takes to, to, to evaluate all the root team of a graph at a, gener at a given generation. But the more uh, root teams you have, the higher the chances to have an interesting mutation at uh, each generation. Yeah, thank you. There is another question? Oh, yes. Um... I'm a bit puzzled here because um, in the very beginning, when you um, had many uh, root teams, uh, are the programs exactly the same? Or because you, you, you discharge those outliers, right? The largest one, the smallest one, and kept the middle ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, are the programs the same for those or not? Uh, at which point? Before when, the when you start uh, in the very beginning, you start. Oh uh, no! Okay. No, uh, the programs are different. Also, uh, when you initialize the graph, you initialize the graph with an initial uh, random structure. So the initial, the, let's say, the, the structure of the graph that you have the, the first generation 
is uh, random, but it's a very simple structure. You only have root teams that are directly linked to uh, action, uh, to action, so to leaves of the graph. So you have a depth, maximum depth of the graph of one. Uh, and the programs that you have between the root team and the, the actions, uh, each program that you have is uh, also initialized completely randomly. So basically, you, you, you have a set of meta parameters for the training process that tells you that the initial program that you have in your graph will have between three and uh, 20 uh, instructions. And you will pick a random number of instruction and you will generate completely random list of the programs that you have as the first generation. So a lot of them will be completely useless. That's exactly the point that I want to reach, because uh, if uh, if the programs are different, and uh, you are kind of uh, um, computing the, the that number that you use and outlining them, uh, how aren't you making some somehow a bit of greedy decision there, because uh, the programs are not the same? How can you assure that the fact that the numbers are uh, the, lar the largest one and the smallest one doesn't reflect some randomness? or doesn't, because you cannot compare them, right? If the programs are different. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, it's not, actually, you, 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 you cannot. <laughs> uh, this is the point. Uh, what you will do is that uh, when you evaluate a root team of your, of your TPG, uh, if you are playing a video game, for example, you will not play the game only once. Uh, you will play several games. Uh, to account for the randomness of the game and to also uh, uh, make sure that you are not just lucky when you play the first game. Let's imagine that you are, play, you are playing Space Invader and because you are very lucky with the random number generation of the game, uh, you, have a, you, are, you have been able to win, but this is pure chance. If you play a, a game a second time, then you will lose probably. And in this case, the average score that you get from this root team will be quite poor. Uh, so yeah, but, but uh, as a, I'm a bit confused because you said there is no correlation between um, the final result that you get from from the game, the number which reflects the, the, your score in the game, and the numbers that are result of the programs in the, the TPG, right? Absolutely, no, no, no. The the only thing that basically that the programs. The number returned by the program makes sense compared to the other program. And this is once again the learned features. Uh, through the natural selection process and generation after generation, the programs that belong to the same team uh, will basically, they will match each other's bid. And to provide some interesting control mechanism, uh, this program will, the natural selection process will make sure that these program can be compared to each other. But this is something that is solely obtained uh, through the, the, the natural selection process. There is absolutely no engineering here. This is really different from a deep neural network where you have some gradient descent and, and some nice mm -hmm. stuff to make sure that everything yeah, no, makes yeah, sense. This part, this, this part I fully understand what I said, but, it, what it, but it's still a bit positive to me, but and you can take this offline uh, sometime, uh, is that, um, if the numbers which come out of the programs um, that they are running from the routines, uh, mm -hmm. they want to have correlation with the, they're just numbers and you, you arbitrarily say, okay, I'm gonna get the, take, remove the outliers, the largest one, the smaller one out. Mm -hmm. uh, since they, uh, which one of those were computed by, by random programs with random set of instructions? Um, it seems a bit odd that, um, by removing the largest one and smallest one, you are you have some assurance that you're gonna get uh, at least to a, a, a very good uh, local uh, maximum right of the storage space. I'm not removing the the largest one. I'm just getting rid of the smallest one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm just selecting the the largest uh, yeah. uh, the but largest uh, score. The fact that, but the fact that the numbers don't reflect the scores. And uh, even if you remove the smallest one, since the programs that compute those numbers are not the same, right? Um, how can you assure that remove the smallest one aren't you making a bad decision? If the programs are not the same, right? And the programs the, 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 the programs don't move. Uh, when I uh, when I create my uh, structure for here, for example, in the previous generation, I had this graph. In the next generation, I have this graph, but all the, the programs that 
were there in the previous generation and are here in the next are identical as uh, to what they are in the previous generation. So, for example, these two programs are still compared to each other when this root team is when this team is executed. I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I so you mean that the programs that are um, the um, destination of the outgoing edges from the root team are the same, always the same for each mutation. Yeah, basically, once you you get a program uh, after a mutation, mm -hmm. this program will always remain the same. Okay. So like, okay. for example, here, the, the, this program, it is a result of a mutation. And from now on, this program won't change. If I want uh, to get an offspring uh, from this program, I will copy this program, mutate the copy of this program. But now this program is fixed forever in the graph. Okay. Okay. So that's why in the very beginning you can you can get rid of the little smallest one. Okay. All right. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Um, one last thing that is interesting with this uh, mutation process is that uh, here, if you are giving a look at this example, uh, the pink uh, node, which used to be a root of the of the tangled program graph, is no longer a root of the TPG. And this is because I have introduced this new uh, root team. And by changing the destination of this program, by, by copying the program and then changing its destination, uh, now uh, this uh, team is becoming an internal uh, node of the graph. And so it is no longer a root team. This is something very important in TPGs. This is called the emergent behavior. Uh, if you have a root team that has some valuable behavior, it will survive uh, for a few generations. And the longer it survives, the higher the chances, the chances are that a new team will try to reference this node as a, a target of one of its program graphs. Why this is very interesting, when it becomes an internal node of the graph, it is no longer exposed to the natural selection process. Uh, now uh, the team that the root team that I will evaluate will be this one, this one, and this one. But at the next generation, this node is no longer a root, so it can no longer uh, uh, disappear uh, when I discard the useless, uh, the, the, the worst performing uh, root of my tangle program graph. And so it will remain in the graph. And the change is that it is being reused by new teams introduced by the graph in the future mutation it becomes higher. So the idea here is that if you have some valuable uh, behavior, it will be protected from mutation. It will be protected from being discarded in, by the natural selection process. And the chance is that it will be reused by other new strategies that are developed in the training process, it becomes much higher. And this is called the emergent behavior process. And that makes sure that some valuable behavior is protected and that the chances that this valuable, valuable behavior uh, becomes integrated with a more complex strategy uh, is higher. Also. OK. When we come at this point, usually the question that I have is, OK, how efficient is this genetic learning process? Because a lot of uh, the training process is completely random. So is it actually able to learn something useful? And also, how do TPGs compare to other modern uh, artificial intelligence techniques? OK, the first, the answers, uh, to provide the answers, uh, this technique has been evaluated on the arcade learning environment. The arcade learning environment is a collection of uh, uh, old video games, such as Pac-Man, Space Invader, or uh, Breakout. And you have a 50 video game. And uh, it's, uh, the, the Atari uh, console is uh, emulated. And so it's very easy to evaluate uh, your reinforcement learning uh, techniques on all of these 50 video games. And so how did uh, TPGs perform? Well. Uh, these results are taken from the, the PhD dissertation of Stephen Kelly, and the results were very good. First of all, uh, TPGs are very efficient learners. And very uh, one of the very nice features that you have is that the complexity of the graph that you obtain at the end of the training, so basically the complexity of the graph stemming from the root that gives you the best uh, score possible for your video game, well, the complexity of this graph as the number of uh, programs, the number of uh, vertices in this graph, adapt itself to the complexity of the video games that you are playing. So if you are playing a very simple uh, game, then you will end up with a graph, the TPG, with only a few, uh, maybe five or 10 uh, teams. So very few teams. 
uh, if you are playing a much more complex video game, such as uh, Pac-Man, for example, then you will end up with a TPG with 100 or even uh, two or 300 uh, teams in the graph uh, to, 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 to develop a much more complex strategy. And of course, the amount of computations that you have to, to perform corresponds to the complexity of the graph. So this is very interesting. And yeah, I will compare this feature later to the deep learning models. Uh, then uh, it is also very fast uh, for the Atari uh, for the arcade learning environment. Uh, we obtained uh, between 3,000 and 11,000 frames per second processed by the TPG. Uh, and the models that you obtain is, at the end are very lightweight. The storage, the amount of memory that you need during the training process to store the whole TPG, uh, rare, uh, usually never exceeds a few hundred kilobytes. So this is very small, and all of this should be compared to the, the competitor, so deep Q learning. Uh, I should mention here that the results, I will answer the question in a few seconds. Uh, I should mention here that the results were compared for similar results. So the TPGs and the deep Q learning on the arcade learning environment uh, in 2017 were providing the exact same results. So the TPG was winning for 50% uh, of the game and the deep Q learning was winning for 50% 50, 50 of the game. And when the TPG is not winning, the score it is able to reach is very close to the deep Q learning uh, model. And when the deep Q learning is not winning, it, the score it is able to reach is also very close to the TPG model. And so what's interesting here is that when you are using deep Q learning, you have a fixed complexity. The developer must choose the deep neural network that it wants to use to uh, perform the deep uh, to perform the deep reinforcement learning uh, process. Uh, the results here are given on the same architecture, so on the same uh, CPU. The GPU here were, here were, was not used for the deep neural learning model, and on the same hardware, uh, you can see that the TPG is much faster than the deep neural learning model. And finally, when it comes to the storage that you need to store the, the trained model, uh, for deep learning models, you need more than 50 megabytes of, uh, of storage to store uh, the model, while you need only a few hundred kilobytes for the, the, the TPG. There was a question. Yeah, no, you answered my, my question already. OK, great. <laughs> uh, how, am I, how am I doing? OK, I talk too much. Um, so. Why so far I didn't present my work. I presented the work from Stephen Kelly and Malcolm Haywood. The reason I'm pre presenting this work is that uh, we have been also working for uh, three years now on a tangled program graph. And the first result of this work is uh, JGLATI, which stands for Generic Evaluable Graph for Efficient Learning of Artificial Tangled Intelligence, which is a reinforcement uh, learning library. Uh, yeah, uh, it was published in uh, DASIP 20, uh, 2021, and we got the best paper award. So this is an important achievement for us. And so this is a TPG framework for training, executing, and customizing a Tangled program graph. Uh, JGLATI is developed as a C++ library. It is uh, portable and determinist uh, on Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac OS. And determinist means that you will have the exact same training results uh, if you train from the, in the same determinist environment. Uh, we try to have a very high uh, code quality with 100% uh, of the code coverage in the continuous integration process. The code is fully documented and everything, everything is open source and available on GitHub. Uh, if you want to, if you are curious about uh, TPGs and you want to get started to train a, a TPG in your learning environment, it's quite easy act to do. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to implement a few uh, methods in a C++ class. So you need to build a, a, a constructor. You need to build a function that uh, tells uh, the TPG how many actions are available in the learning environment. Uh, you need to provide uh, the data that correspond to the state of the environment. And you need to code an action that is basically the game over of your uh, learning environment. Then to perform the action, you need to code the do action method to interact uh, with the environment and the reset method, uh, which is needed in the training process. And finally, the, re the re reward is simply given by the get score uh, function. So you just need to code these, uh, these, uh, these methods and you're all set to try training a TPG graph. 
We have a set of uh, open source applications that you can already uh, play with uh, if you want to. The first one is the set of a uh, game from the Atari uh, uh, video games, so the RL, uh, arcade learning environment. Then we have an inverted pendulum. Uh, here, the purpose is to bring the pendulum in the upward position. We have a classification uh, environment based on the MNIST data set. We have multiplayer games such as Tic-Tac-Toe, and we also have a robotic arm uh, that we can play with. Um, I will switch this part, actually. I'm a bit out of time. Uh, a few original features that we have in uh, JGLATI, which uh, are really our work. The first one is we, that we have some embeddable deterministic parallelism. So when you want to train the Tangle program graph on a multi-core architecture, uh, you can fully benefit from all the cores in your architecture. And one uh, selling result that we have is that for uh, an architecture with uh, 21 core, with uh, 24 cores, a uh, Xeon uh, architecture from Intel, uh, we were able to speed up the training process by a factor 21, which is quite good. And we retain all the determinism of the training process. So this means that if you are training in the same learning environment with the same uh, pseudo random uh, seed, uh, you will get the exact same result at the end of the parallel training process. Yes, question. How, how, what is the uh, parallelism here? Is uh, the running the application parallelism? Yeah, this is the training process. So what you can do in parallel here is uh, evaluating the roots of the TPGs on, of, the, of the TPG on the learning environment. So you need uh, the learning environment to to be uh, runnable in parallel. Uh, and also some part of the mutations that you apply to the graph can be done in parallel. So the structural changes that you make to the graph have to be sequential. So when you add some nodes or when you you switch change the target of a program, uh, this has to be done sequentially because you have only one graph and it's a bit complex to 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 modify it with a parallel cores uh, accessing to it. But uh, the mutations that you can do to the program, uh, these can be done in parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a second interesting original feature that we have is that we provide the possibility to customize the instruction set that you give to the, give to the TPG. So uh, in the work from Stephen Kelly, the only instructions that you can use in the, that you could use in the program were addition, multiplication, subtraction, exponential, logarithm, and the maximum between uh, two functions. And in Jagelati, you can provide what if, you can customize the, the instruction set that you give to the TPG, and you can give anything. So you can even give a convolution or you can uh, give an instruction that will take some 1, 1D array of data in your data source. Uh, you can have an operation an instruction with 10 operands if you want or one with a single operand. So you, you can do whatever you want in the instruction set. And this is very important to us because what we have in mind here is that you could tailor your instruction set to maximize its efficiency on a given hardware. So for example, you could give a RIS-5 uh, uh, instruction set that would make sure that the trained TPG will have instructions that are very hardware friendly. Yes, there was a question. No. I had the yeah. ping of a, someone yes, raising that. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was muted here. Uh, the benchmark you use, the, the elements of it um, are a bit kind of uh, coarse grain, right? I mean, you, you have the avian, you have the, the cannon, you have uh, the arm of the robot. Um, you don't have many, um, you don't have many smooth elements in the image, right? So my question is, uh, instead of having like very primitive uh, operations in the programs, like some summation or even a little bit higher level called like convolution, could someone um, have operands which reflect the position of the these course elements in the in the game, for example? Would, would yeah. that be helpful somehow? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, we haven't tried it so far, but we know that there is a, a company uh, in uh, the city uh, I work in uh, that is also that has developed their own uh, implementation of the TPGs, and one of the kind of instructions that they use is an instruction that is able to locate uh, 
uh, some pixel. If, for example, if they are working on an image, uh, they can locate some pixel in the image. So basically, you the operand start at a given position. This is uh, from the training process, and the result of the instruction will be the the distance uh, to the closest pixel with the same color or with the, the a different color or something like that. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand that. But uh, we just somehow semantically associate with the the the, the what the game they're playing, right? Or this, the problem that they're doing, image they're doing it. But I was wondering more on the directions or even higher level. Like for example, we have instruction which is um, get the position of uh, of some the alien or uh, somehow get a block uh, in one of those games that you want to pack the blocks. You know what I mean? It, the, the, the operations are more have carry some of the information about the game per se. Yeah, it's doable. Uh, basically, to do that, you just need to create an instruction that takes the whole. Uh, if you are working on an image, it, that takes the whole image as the input, and that produces the position that you are looking for. Yeah, but so you, you, you do need the the because you're working with the image, you would need to pre-process to get that, and this would be expensive somehow, right? So yeah, basically, the, the, instruction, the instruction will be expensive if it is yeah, used. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but, but the, the, that's why I'm thinking that maybe instead of looking at the image, you could look at the some sort of semantic graph of the image. Like you have mm -hmm. the positions of uh, of the, the, the aliens, and because this, this, this data structure is probably already behind uh, in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Inside of the, the, the game code. But anyhow, OK. All right, thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, the last key feature that we have uh, that we are currently advertising is that we have a way to have some ultra fast uh, inference. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, when you train the, the CPG, you need to maintain the graph, you need to maintain the programs in which are flexible graphs in program. You need to be able to mutate them and add instruction, remove instructions and, and add some nodes in the graph and so on. And all of this flexibility is not needed if you are in a scenario where you just want to do the to do the inference. And in in such a scenario, we have a way to generate some code. So we take the the, the best uh, TPG uh, resulting from a training process, and we translate this into C code into C code which is completely independent from the library. And by doing that, we have uh, been able to show that. On, on a, basically on the CPU, on the desktop uh, computer CPU, we are able to speed up the inference by a factor 25, and we are on an embedded, uh, on an embedded core, an ARM, ARM A7 core. Uh, we were able to speed up the, the inference by a factor 85 uh, with a single core. This is not, uh, we are not using any parallelism for inference at the moment. And this is just by generating some code, uh, which is able to, to to do the inference as a standalone code. Um, I think at this point, uh, my time is mostly over. Uh, I have some backup slides to detail any of the features I have presented in, but I think it's better to stop and see if you have any questions. OK, so I have, I have one question. Uh, how does it scale uh, with the complexity of the problem? Mm -hmm. I will show you. Uh, I have a backup slide for it. Uh, the backup slide. OK, uh, here it is. Uh, oh, the next one will be more interesting. <clears throat> Uh, here, this is a figure uh, which represents uh, the number of generation of the training process uh, on the x axis and the number of teams of the Tangle program graph on the y axis. And here you can see that the, the scaling is automatic, is completely automated. Uh, basically, for some video games, uh, you will reach the best strategy and you will uh, steady uh, the number of uh, teams that you have in your graph at around 10 teams, whereas for some more complex games, uh, you will reach uh, several hundreds of teams. And th the reason why the complexity uh, stabilizes when it reaches the, the point where it has the best score is that basically when the score, the, re the maximum reward that you give to the, the to the TPG uh, is uh, obtained, then the no complexity, no additional complexity will be added to the TPG. And one way to see that is just 
to have a look at the, the curve, the small curve that is at the bottom of the picture, which represents the number, the average number of uh, teams that you have in the TPG with the best score. If you select the team that survive at each generation uh, completely randomly, so you are not selecting the, the best team to survive at the next generation, you are just selecting random team at each generation. And in such a case, the number of teams that you have in your TPG in the best uh, route uh, will more or less stay, stay the same and it will stay uh, between one and two teams. So the complexity increases only if some new valuable behavior is discovered by one of the team of the root team of the TPG. And so this is how it scales to the complexity of the problem. But uh, what, what does it mean in terms of, uh, of time, execution time? So the the the, of the, the x I, here the, the x here is what is the x here because I I don't see it what is uh... so you mean what will be the execution time of the team depend of the TPG depending on their complexity yes it's okay it's proportional to two things uh, the most important uh, thing that you need to know. Uh, to to know how much time it will take to run a TPG for inference is uh, the thing that is represented by the small x here. Uh, this thing represents the average number of team visited for each inference. So each time you receive a new state, you visit only a sub part of the graph. And here you can see that, for example, for the asteroid game, uh, you only visit two teams uh, when you do each inference. For some more complex uh, game, you will visit uh, five, seven, sometimes a bit more, sometimes 10 teams uh, to perform the inference. And this is actually what gives you the complexity of the inference uh, of the inference of your graph. Uh, the more teams you visit during an inference, the more time it will take to execute this uh, inference. Okay, so it doesn't seem to to change too much. No, that, this is true. Even when you have a very large graph, uh, in our experiment, we have the same result as here. We rarely have uh, more than seven, eight teams visited for an inference. It can happen, but it's very rare. So in the end, the complexity uh, of the, the inference remains quite low. Okay. Yes, Guido. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit confused about some uh, some points that you mentioned. Um, when, for example, in a model that has been already trained, okay, yes. uh, you you have like a, you have a couple of, of routines or just one at the end. You have a graph. You have a, a yeah, yeah, one, but, but the root, one the root, with one root team. Yeah. At the end, okay, and you have a, a kind of layers of teams is, uh, until you get to an action, right? Yes, absolutely. Leading okay. to several so, actions. Yes. And uh, as I said before, uh, you start with uh, um, uh, a graph which is uh, depth one, okay, and then you keep adding intermediate layers in between the actions and the routines till you, yes. you, you get it trained. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Understand that. Uh, but um, my question is uh, now on the inference side. Um, what is the metric that you have that to evaluate accuracy because in when you do like a traditional CNN training, I mean, mm -hmm. you have a, a, a kind of a, a model there, a self of inputs that are uh, annotated and you know that and use that to guide the, your, your graded, graded descent. And then you can measure an accuracy. What is the accuracy here that you measure then when you have the trained model already? So in the reinforcement learning, uh context, the metric that you are trying to optimize is the reward that you get. So that you basically get from the environment. Okay. that you get from the environment. Now, okay. if you want to trick the TPGs uh, to try to make it learn uh, an uh, a classification task where you will want to maximize the accuracy, then you will just uh, present a batch of uh, samples to the, to the TPG. Uh, you will let it for each uh, sample in the batch, you will let it say uh, which class it belongs to. And in the end, you can use the, the accuracy or the F1 score as the, as the reward that you give to the TPG. So you okay. can okay. actually uh, trick the TPG to learn some classification by simply uh, training it on the accuracy. Uh, 
there is no gradient descent though. Okay, okay, understood. Um, and, and regarding benchmarking and comparison with uh, other works, right? I mean, um, I, I fully understand that this approach is probably going to get uh, very low power and uh, well tailored to embedded systems. Absolutely, totally agree with that. Yes. But um, regarding the accuracy uh, in terms of uh, the, the final score, um, do people did people have developed um, some CNN models for this kind of games? And if they did, uh, how do they compare the kind of uh, real uh, score that they, they get from a, a CNN approach and uh, the TPG approach. I, I fully understand that we cannot compare those if uh, if you think that okay, I'm not gonna add, move one CNN model to some embedded systems, although we already have hardware, very efficient hardware doing uh, uh, like CTN's one, which is recognize speech from Alexa and so on. In the, in the embed, embedded f uh, sphere, you already have good CNN engines working there, right, doing that thing in hardware. But I, I agree with you, I mean, it's totally makes total sense to use some approach like this, uh, you're going to be much more efficient. But let's forget about the, the power consumption and, uh, uh, and the embedded environment. Okay. What is the, if you, if you have some models, CNN models trained for this kind of games, what is the, the score that they can reach and what is the average score compared with the TPG approach? So uh, the, the, the scores that you can get uh, are the one, uh, okay, historically, let's say in 2017, uh, <clears throat> let me go back a bit. Uh, in 2017, yes, this is here. Uh, the scores that you get uh, between the deep uh, Q-learning, which is based on the CNN, uh, okay. and the TPG uh, were the same. Uh, this was with the state of the art. I, I think in the, his PhD, uh, Kelly uh, is using two or three different state of the art uh, CNN uh, models. Uh, he's not comparing, uh, okay, he is also comparing his, the, the complexity, but he's really uh, comparing the score uh, obtained with the DQN and the deep learning and, and the, 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 the scores. Okay. Yeah, okay. and the, the score are the same. Uh, okay. Okay. That's yeah. Right. Now, since then, uh, there has been some uh, extra work on the deep query learning side, and some new models have been proposed that have much better results than what they did in 2017. And so now I think the TPG uh, was not able to keep up. Uh, yeah. Also, if you compare on some other tasks, uh, TPG is not going very well. This is the, maybe the dark side of TPG. Uh, at the moment, uh, the raw results that you can obtain with TPG compared to CNN on any classification task. And I mentioned uh, MNIST uh, before. Uh, we can also think about uh, Cypher 10 that has been tried also. The results that you can obtain with the TPG are much lower than what you can obtain with a, uh, a CNN. For a compar, for a compar, for if you have the same complexity in the two models, then TPG wins. Uh, but if you don't care about the complexity of the CNN for the classification classification task at the moment, uh, CNNs are winning uh, by a landslide. But okay. TPG also has some interesting interesting uh, feature. If the data set is not very well balanced or even strongly imbalanced, uh, we have a, pub a paper published a few uh, months ago that shows that TPGs are much more resilient uh, to the imbalance of the data set than uh, than the, the CNN. Okay, uh, and, and my last question, why, why Darth Vader? <laughs> why did you pick Lucas Skywalker? <laughs> because, uh, I don't know, the, the name sounded fine. <laughs> it sounded good too. <laughs> the acronym was uh, easier to build. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, appreciate it. Thank You're you. welcome. <laughs> so with uh, your, I just have one last question. With your um, uh, framework, uh yes. you you didn't uh run the experiment uh, comparing with the uh, deep learning model you, you are just basing your assumption on on some other people results right yeah at the moment yes we want to yeah yeah we, we want to make some further comparison uh especially on the robotic arm. We have some interesting results in the robotic arm, but uh, we want to compare them with uh, the state of the art on the robotic. But uh, yeah, 
we want to push the TPG. So this means that at some point we have to compare our results with the CNNs, uh, because now if you want to publish anything on machine learning, you have to compare yourself with the CNN. But uh, our main goal is to say, okay, this is an, also an interesting uh, method, method, and uh, we want to push it and we want to to see what it can do. And even if the answer is uh, we are uh, ten times, I don't know, ten percent less efficient, uh, less accurate than CNN, but we are uh, one thousand times less complex. I think we win because we win on the, the complexity table. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and you don't need to have uh, those uh, new, very uh, specialized architecture to do the, the the convolution and so on that are, that everybody Absolutely. is trying to develop uh, nowadays. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Our main competitors here are the random forest uh, and uh, I think the Markov uh, decision process. They, they are the, I, I think, they are our main competitors in terms of uh, sim simple complexity. <laughs> and do you, did you try to compare them to your uh, to accuracy and some stuff like this? So so far ourselves no, because the two the three papers that we published were on. Uh, on uh, embedded, so how to make it parallel and how to to have the the inference uh, with the generated code. So in this case, we did not have to compare our results with the the, the other models. Uh, Kelly, uh, no, Malcolm Haywood did a new paper paper recently last year, I think, on the classification, and he compared also to I think it was to Markov decision process and the complexity. Uh, Accuracy trade-offs of the TPG was interesting. It was on the classification of uh, on cipher 10, and the results of the TPGs were interesting. They also had some comparison for the for the how is it called uh, the, the the temporal uh, prediction uh, temporal uh, temporal series prediction uh, environment, and the results of the TPG were promising. They were not competitive yet with uh, all the techniques, but the, the preliminary results were pro were promising. One thing that is important to remember is that at the moment, uh, the people in, so uh, Kelly, that is now with uh, the University of Michigan, and uh, Haywood, that is still in Canada, are working on this. We are working on this. And we know that there is a company in Rennes working on this also uh, with their private uh, closed source uh, results. But so far, this is all. So uh, yeah, we cannot compete with these other models where uh, hundreds or thousands of researchers have been working on them for, for 10 years. Yeah, but sure. uh, maybe one day. <laughs> sure, sure. Nice. Thank you. Any other question? Anyone? Yes, Pedro. Um, I was curious about the training time. Uh, do do these, uh, these models take a lot more time to train than the traditional uh, CNNs or something? Um, not, okay, let's say not really. Uh, basically, what takes time in the, the training is the, the environment in, in our case. The inference is very fast. Uh, and the, the, what takes time is to, to just simulate uh, the environment. So, for example, when you want to train the TPGs in the RK learning environment, it takes some time because uh, each time you want to play a game, you need to emulate uh, the whole Atari uh, game and you need to play the game several times. So for example, in this context, the first generation on a regular uh, desktop CPU will take, uh, I don't know, six, seven minutes for with, uh, with uh, 300 uh, routes. Uh, but it will take a lot of time also on the, to, to train it with the, the with the CNN, you also need to play the game many times. So yeah, the, the mutation process is very fast, and the inference is very fast. So structurally, if the environment you are playing in is simple, the training will be fast. Uh, for example, if you need, if you think about the other learning environment that we have, for example, the pendulum, uh, you can do uh, I don't know in uh, each generation uh, of the training process will take. Uh, on a regular desktop CPU, it will take a few, I don't know, two or three seconds, uh, sometimes even less, uh, uh, with the graph with uh, also, I don't know, 500 roots. So it, it really depends on the complexity of the learning environment. Understood. Thanks. You're welcome. One last question, anyone? 
now. So let's thank uh, Carol for his uh, presentation. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you again for, for the invitation. You're welcome, Carol.